Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thank you, Tim Ashman, Johnny Hernandez, High Tech Oki, and Alan Stearns. On this episode of DTNS, Canadian school boards sue all the social networks. Cops can shoot GPS trackers at fleeing cars now. And does China have an edge in AI talent? How do we measure it? This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, March 29th, 2024. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. From Studio Redwood adjacent, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And I'm Andrea Jonesroy in New York City. Hello. Data science professor Andrea Jonesroy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. And thank you as I coughed up a piece of apple for jumping in and introducing yourself. Yep. <laughs> You're a total pro. I, I, just... I didn't leap to, you know, save you from the apple, but I did leap to say my own name. So uh, we'll go with that selfishness. Well, while I try to cough that up, let's start with the quick hits. <laughs> The U.S. succeeded in almost killing network equipment and handphone maker Huawei when it imposed restrictions on supplying it with parts or intellectual property from U.S. companies. Now, Huawei has found a new path, riding on some creative thinking and national patriotism uh, with the company's handsets, rising in sales in China, while all other brands, foreign and domestic, are generally falling. Huawei also just announced its fastest growth in four years, with revenue up 9.63%, mostly coming from the consumer business. The New York Times sources say Meta will add some of its multimodal generative models to the Ray-Ban smart glasses starting next month. Features have been available in early access since December. Uh, they can do things like translate, uh, identify objects like pets, or art, or landmarks. The glasses support English, French, German, Italian, and Spanish. If you happen to be a U.S. Google Podcast user, you have a few more days to transition to a new podcast service before the Google One shuts down on April 2nd. Google recommends its users export their subscriptions to YouTube Music. Of course they do. But you can also export your feeds as an OPML file and then add them to any other podcast app as well. Users outside the U.S. apparently have a little bit more time to figure out what they're going to do with a YouTube music support page saying Google Podcasts will not shut down entirely until July. Hey, so I guess you could VPN too. I don't know how that works. Uh, one of the biggest growth areas for AI is companies making bespoke models that they can roll out to their customers. Maybe a customer support chat bot or, or a sales bot or some other function. But when companies do that, they take a lot of risk because they are now responsible for what that chatbot says. Microsoft Chief Product Officer of Responsible AI, that's a title at Microsoft, Sarah Bird, told The Verge that Azure customers who can't afford their own red teams to test AI instances can use some new tools to keep them safe to use for their customers. There are three tools coming out right away. Prompt Shield, which blocks the malicious prompts that a customer, or really an attacker, might use to try to fool the LLM into revealing information it's not supposed to. Groundedness Detection. I don't think that's a word, but okay. Groundedness Detection, which blocks hallucinations, aka incorrect facts. And Safety Evaluations, which looks for model vulnerabilities. Two more tools for Azure AI users are coming soon. One will be used for nudging models towards safe outputs and another to flag potentially problematic users. The safety features are immediately attached if you're using a GPT-4 or Meta Llama 2 model and you can point the other smaller models, uh, you can point them at the other smaller models if you want, as long as Azure supports that model. Hanuki.com reports that Samsung has faced poor yields for 11-inch OLED displays that are meant for new iPads. Apple has reportedly had to transfer some of the production of those new iPads to LG Display. New iPads are now expected to be announced in May. That's according to Bloomberg's Mark Ehrman. All right, big thanks to TaxiCab over on our subreddit, uh, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com, who alerted us to the story earlier this week. Four school boards in Ontario, Canada, are suing Meta, Snap, and ByteDance for a combined $4.5 billion, alleging that Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Snapchat create products designed to negatively affect children. The school boards allege in a press release that students are experiencing an attention, learning, and mental health crisis because of, quote, 
prolific and compulsive use of social media products. Snapchat and TikTok issued statements denying the allegations and arguing their apps are designed to combat such negative effects. Ontario's Premier Doug Ford said he disagrees with the school board's lawsuits. Uh, he says, look, phones were banned in Ontario classrooms in 2019. So if they're using these things in the class to begin with, uh, that that's a problem. We should already crack down on that. Uh, Andrea, I know you didn't teach high school, but, you know, you've, you've taught some 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 folks fresh out of high school in, yeah. in some cases. Uh, what's your take as an educator on this? Phones in classrooms are a nightmare, and I feel like that makes me sound like I'm completely out of touch and uh, anti-tech, but I, I promise you that the, the, the students in class who are just on their phones and just zoned out scrolling uh, are not doing very well in class. And so if, you know, just putting it on, on Do Not Disturb and putting it away does wonders. I was one of those professors, I have opinions about this, who didn't allow laptops in my classroom for a long time. But I do teach programming, and so that did actually become a little bit difficult um, to enforce, and so I caved on that. But it really is distracting. And if if I'm sitting in an audience and I have my phone out or my computer out, I'm not paying attention. I also, last thing on this, noticed that uh, something that I find very chilling for my own personal reasons is I would gather outside the classroom. Uh, I was at NYU. Like, uh, you know, in these big classrooms, all the students are milling around, waiting to go into our room. They're all on their phones. When I was their age, I was talking to my classmates, asking questions, doing whatever, getting to know one another, and everyone is just sitting there silently. So it's not just in the classroom. I really feel like it's had a dampening effect on the culture in the classroom outside of it. But theoretically, yeah, that's I mean, what they're doing on Snapchat and TikTok, right? Is talking to their classmates just I, over the social networks. They might be shit talk, pardon me. They might be talking, saying bad things about me uh, during class. They all have WhatsApp <laughs> groups and WeChat groups and all the rest. So that's no, no doubt about that. But I mean, they're scrolling social media. They're not you know, checking on homework answers, as far as I can tell. I mean, it sounds like, and it's interesting that um, uh, Ontario Premier Ford said he disagrees with the school board as lawsuits going after this, um, I guess, in the manner that they did. But, you know, eh, I don't have children. Um, I I was a child once, um, and there was no social media at the time. So, you know, I can't begin to understand how much of this is either a distraction or, you know, just a downright harm on certain kinds of kids and their learning abilities, right? Like, the, the idea is to make kids be, you know, as safe as possible while they're learning, all is good. Um, and as a teacher, you have a really hard job anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but, you know, banning, uh, phones, laptops, uh, you know, basically anything that can be online outside of school. I mean, that's one step, but if a kid is having a hard time focusing, learning, understanding things because of this, and that can be proven that I think this lawsuit is actually pretty interesting. Yeah. And I think it's worth refocusing this. It, it, the ban already existed. That That's mm -hmm. not what's at issue. What What's at issue is that uh, the school boards are saying that these companies design their products possibly in a negligent way, maybe not on purpose, although the, the lawsuit is pretty strongly worded, uh, in a way that damages mm -hmm. children. And it affects them in the school. And that gives the school board the standing to sue. Roger, you are a parent. Uh, yes, your kids are are, kids are a little on the young young end of this, but they'll be heading towards this situation soon. How do you feel? I one, I think phones should be should be uh, blocked uh, on school campus campus grounds. But I think social media has created a, a kind of a, a parallel social network universe that yeah. that, that that happens in a way that I think. Will negatively impacts uh, can neg negatively impact children uh, because uh, they're they're it's a way of them communicating with people they feel comfortable with, and one of the things you learn in school, and as someone who was bullied a lot in school, you kind of have to learn how to manage relationships that aren't necessarily always in your favor, mm -hmm. right? And it, it's and, my, and unfortunately, you know, one of my children has ADHD, and so you know using her tablet although not social media because i've pretty I've, I've put the kibosh on that uh for now but she does talk to one of her close friends over over through roblox uh my youngest just yesterday wanted to do the same thing we said no and she threw a tantrum for 15 and like the legs and the arms flailing yeah. and the screaming and 
I'm curious to know how this turns out because we do block certain things, for example, alcohol, cigarette advertising, mm -hmm. uh, from a certain distance away from where from children schools are. Um, this could be seen in that way, although because it is a digital, you know, a, a digital platform, you don't have a there's no physicality that you can you can put up. But I mean. Do, I, so I don't know. You're, it's, you're saying it, it's possible that that Facebook and Instagram should be regulated like cigarettes and drinks and alcohol. I mean, it's it, it could very well be if not if not if not in Canada somewhere else. I definitely. I want to know what the possible. evidence of the harm is. Right. I feel like there's a lot of like we we think it's bad, and so let's ban it. And I'm not saying it isn't bad, right. but. I, I don't know that the due diligence has been done and the studies have been done to show how the harm is perpetrated because it, you may introduce, it's possible you introduce more harm by banning students from social networks, which cause them to use them out in, in ways that aren't detected uh, right. and pretend to be adults and things like that. That, that would be worse than if you're like, Oh, you know, the harm comes from this. Let's focus on stopping that kind of yeah behavior from so there's a new book out by a scholar at, at NYU named Jonathan Haidt and it is specifically about Gen Z and smartphones so it's not social media but it's about smartphones and basically summarizing the research that he chose to, to to focus on that says yeah it's pretty bad for learning but Tom I'm with you that it's you know there's a lot of gradients between ban versus no ban one is how old are the students you know I could imagine something like preschool first grade being in person and interacting matters more than in my class where if you're an 18 to 22 year old Part of learning to be an adult in society is managing, I got to pay attention to this, and I have a phone in my pocket that, of course, if an emergency happens, I can attend to, but I also am learning to regulate my own attention. And so I think in my classroom, it's very different from little kids, but there's also the class itself, right? So a couple of people in the chat have mentioned, look, you know, what if you, as the teacher, train students how to Google more effectively? And I would do this. I'd say, hey, we're coding. You got an error in your code. Here's mm. how to learn how to figure out what the error is. Use the internet, use chat GPT, and we do it live. Whereas if you're reading poetry and reflecting on it, then maybe you don't need it in front of you. And so I think there's more to it than just a black white ban, but there is research that mostly is, is suggesting from what I have seen that it's mostly not great for children. Well, and we're talking about 13 plus, I'm guessing here. Mm, uh, yeah. Like I don't, I don't think these social networks allow, uh, right. I, I know there was some, yeah, I know there was some talk of having Instagram provide kid-friendly versions of accounts, um, but but we're mostly talking about high schoolers here. So, yeah. I, I I do think it's it, it's not as as simple as like you design these to harm children, and so you owe four and a half billion dollars either. Like I feel like that that doesn't necessarily fix the problem either. Uh, but I guess it's going to make a lot of parents and and teachers feel better if they win this i'm not sure if they'll win it i'm not sure what the the i'm not well versed enough on the canadian canadian law here to say i mean it's sort of reminding me of the lawsuit against jewel right that was saying you're marketing nicotine to children uh -huh. and that like the the ability to specifically like you were saying demonstrate that it was done out of malice or out of negligence and has specifically had this you know we can identify the mechanism through which it's doing something harmful to children maybe Otherwise, it does seem a bit misguided to go after. It's just because something's bad for students in the classroom, maybe on average, not all cases, doesn't necessarily mean that the provider of it is at fault. But that's the basis of all social media and internet regulation debates in the U.S. too. So it's not yeah, like yeah. That's the answer. Well, The Drive reports that old Westbury police in New York, uh, Long Island, uh, uh, Hamlet, I suppose, is using vehicle-mounted projectile launches to fire GPS trackers embedded in foam darts with sticky glue in them. Stay with me on the story because it, it is real. The darts are made by a company called Star Chase. The idea is to reduce the need for a dangerous high-speed chase if somebody happens to be, you know, going crazy down the road and a cop is following them. While tracking the suspects, you would only need to chase them long enough to fire the sticky dart uh, to, you know, get on the back of the car and then figure out where the car is going and maybe, you know, have a safer uh, arena to to uh, make sure that the car doesn't uh, go any farther with minimal uh, issues for anybody in the community, plus the driver, plus the uh, police who are following them. Now, 
This is not the first time this has happened. If you haven't heard about this before, it, it has happened at certain police departments in Michigan, Tennessee, Texas, and Washington State. So how do we feel about this idea? Now, you know, and let's get our jokes out about, you know, if you live in L.A., you love a good car chase because yeah, we have exactly. a lot of them. Thank but you. but This will but never the- fly in Los Angeles. It is our God-given rights as citizens of Los Angeles to watch high-speed car chases on the news. It is our, our- major form of entertainment. That, that I don't even said, live in L.A. That said, and, uh, yeah. OJ right. chase I mean, is formative for my life. Yeah. Totally. Totally. That said, you know, when it really comes down to it, a lot of people's safety is at risk when something like this happens. You know, Absolutely. it's not yeah. just about the helicopter. It's about all the people on the ground because things are happening in weird ways. You know, the, you know, driver is acting erratically, et cetera, et cetera. So <laughs> I think let's, I, let's, I, let's, let's make it very clear. When there's a high speed chase, you have two cars that can run into folks and kill them. Uh, if you hit right. them with a GPS tracker, you have no high speed chase. Because there's no one chasing the suspect. You're just tracking them. So that's much safer for everybody. What I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's case by case, but it's like, that might be, okay, we can get them around this bend because we know where they're going. Or we just wait till they get off the road and then, you know, go find the person, you know, who is the perpetrator at risk. I mean, every, every case is different. This is, you know, in, it, it raises a lot of questions. It raises questions about, you know, can you be tracked legally at any mm-hmm. point? You know, because if you're if you're fleeing from a scene of something, you haven't necessarily committed a crime. You might have. You might not have. And, you know, that 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 is one school of thinking. There's another school of thinking saying if you're doing something that is, har- you know, potentially harming anybody else then yeah, this is the right call. If you were to be tracked before or after an incident, that's not okay, you know, without, you know, a warrant or, you know, something uh, similar. But uh, but yeah. It, it, it seems like this is pretty clear cut. Situation. There is a there is a Supreme Court case, U.S. versus Jones, not Jones Roy, uh, but Jones, uh, <laughs> that ruled that tracking a car without a warrant constitutes an illegal search. However, the ACLU has weighed in on this and said if someone is a valid suspect, right, uh, which is usually what happens with a high-speed car chase, the, the police saw them commit the, the crime or have, have credible evidence that they committed the crime and they chase after them, in those cases where you could chase after them, it's fair to track them until you've apprehended them. And as long as you don't continue to track them after the apprehension or, or after the case, as long as you're not using it to continue to track them, the ACLU, of all people, is fine with this. Mm. All right. Yeah. Andrea, what, where do you fall on this? <laughs> I mean, until the ACLU came along and was like, yeah, we're OK. I was like, this seems shady. Right. I mean, my my two thoughts go to where you were pointing out, which is, you know, how do you decide when to chase this person? How do you decide when to take this thing off this person? How do we know that we're not also going to secretly use these darts to track the person I'm stalking or or someone else that I want to, you know, uh, uh, conduct a heist on later on. Like, it just seems like it's ripe for misuse. But then my other question is, don't the, now that the story is out and now that this is a thing that people are using, don't people who've just committed crimes now know to look to see if their car has been tagged with a tiny dart? Or is that not as easy to detect as it seems? Like on the picture, it seems like yeah. you figure it out, right? You just pull it off. It's a little Nerf dart. Yeah, you wait until you've gotten far enough away that the cops aren't chasing you anymore, and then you just put stop it and pull car. it off. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Maybe the glue, the glue, it's a heat activated glue, so mm. maybe that makes it difficult to pull off. And if you stop also, long enough, then they come and apprehend you because it's not a high speed chase anymore. I also think you know, if for some reason, um, you know, uh, law enforcement was like, "I want to track Sarah," you know, I think she might be about to do something weird then I'm not vigilant about this. You know, you know, I'm not saying that somebody's going to track me unlawfully, but if they were to, and I wasn't, um, you know, in a high speed chase scenario, I might not notice. And that would be a legal issue. Yeah, that's going not forward. the situation we're talking about. Here, it isn't. Right? That's, no. That's what the ACLU said is like, look, if somebody flees the police, they are by definition breaking the law at that point. Mm-hmm. And so it's fine yeah. to track them. Yeah. But if you were using this in the situation like you're talking about, Sarah, then it would not be OK. So, yeah, it feels like, Adria, you're right that you would know 
if you're like, oh, I'm fleeing, I bet that, and I heard the bunk. <laughs> you know, I don't know how <laughs> they're made of home. foam, so maybe you or can't you just hear like, it. Or but... you look at your trunk later and yeah. go, but I, yeah, you know. Get, well, get later they probably apprehended you by then, right? So yeah. I, I feel yeah. like it's only long enough for you to be able to stop quickly and pull it off. But that's where I think the glue probably keeps it from mm -hmm. being easy to pull it off. I mean, on balance, it sounds like of the tech innovations that could end humanity, I'm mostly fine with this one. And uh, as someone in the chat said, you can misuse anything, many yeah. things in particular that police pe police people, policemen have, police officers have, can be misused. And it, it sounds like a lot of bodies are weighing in on when you can use it, when you can. And there's similar legislation around GPS tracking and other trackers you might put in people's cars. So if on average we're we're mostly minimizing people dying in high speed crash or uh, high speed car chases. And we can tackle the other surveillance issues that come up with not just this, but other things. Then, plus we get to live in Batman world. It's kind of awesome. Exactly. I like exactly. To find it mostly fun. <laughs> Frankly, the misuse of this, yeah, uh, is probably not firing a dart at people, which is more likely to be seen. Yeah. Yeah. It's like secretly hiding the tracker in the wheel well when no one's looking, right? right? right. So I'm less worried about the misuse of them firing foam darts at wild <laughs> at people. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, and I, and I think this is, you know, a decent way to uh, minimize the, the risk to innocent bystanders. So um, I mean, even I here in, in New York City, where we're not known for our car chases, we have times where police are really screaming down sixth avenue and yeah right so why not yeah uh have either one of you thought about the roman empire today I not you were today gonna no car chase. no yeah not today uh, no they used to have high-speed chariot chases in, in the Roman Empire. Yeah, I don't think about the Roman Empire all that often, um, but that didn't stop Roger and I from putting together a top five ancient Roman technologies we still use today. Oh, wow. If you would like to catch up on what from the Roman Empire is still used in the technological world right now, you can catch it in our <laughs> top five at Daily Tech News Show on TikTok, DTNS Picks on Instagram, and YouTube.com slash Daily Tech News Show. The New York Times published a story last Friday regarding research showing that China is producing 50% of the world's talent in AI, and the United States produces 18% percent of the global total of talent in AI. For China, that number is up from a third from three years earlier, whereas the U.S. number is consistent. We just keep pumping them out at an 18 percent rate. Uh, the study came from Marco Polo, a think tank run by the Paulson Institute that promotes constructive U.S.-China ties and was based on the backgrounds of researchers who had their papers published at the Conference on Neural Information Processing Systems in 2022. Now, Andrea, you taught data science in the U.S. and in China. Yes. Uh, so you you have a unique perspective on this. Uh, do you trust this metric? And and what do you make of this disparity? Yeah, so it's it's two good questions. And, and I did teach in both China and the U.S. and in both contexts had students from China and from the U.S. and then in the U.S. from China and from the U.S. So the, all four quadrants of ah, uh, nice. two by two have been covered in this. And I do think that you know, two things stand out to me. One, I was a little bit disappointed to find when I went to China um, to teach that all the stereotypes are true. The Americans were terrible at math. The Chinese students were amazing at math. And we had a real crisis when it came to like the placement tests because there were supposed to be these integrated courses and all the students who had come up in the Chinese system were just placed much higher. But then we, ha we had to teach essay courses and all the American students could write long essays about this is my opinion on that. And this is my opinion on that. And my Chinese students would really struggle to, sh to, to write, you know, and so I was really dismayed that all these stereotypes came true. Um, we worked a lot to, to undo them, but there is truth to it. And so at first plus, first blush, you read this article and you say, well, it's not surprising, right? China has a long history of really outstanding math, engineering, STEM programs. Traditionally, they do send many, many students to the United States, many of whom I've taught at the undergraduate level, and I also do admissions for the graduate level. We have many, many excellent applicants from China. Uh, many students in the NYU master's program in data science uh, are currently from China, uh, many from India as well, but China is the largest group. And, and, and the, the training is excellent. They're excellent students. Again, I'm speaking in broad, broad general terms about the education system. Where I get a little bit uncomfortable with this article 
and with the Marco Polo study and with the broader conversation around kind of the AI talent competition, one, I don't know that we need to make it this geopolitical contest. Uh, Marco Polo is really designed to, as you said, promote cross national co cooperation. So this sort of like how many of us are from here and how many of us are from there doesn't feel in the spirit of that, but much, much more importantly, I completely disagree with how they're deciding what counts as AI top talent. So they're using the term both in the article and in the study that they're referencing. Uh, talent as this, like, I think the study even says it's very quantifiable. So no problem there. I don't know about you, but I don't know how you quantify talent. I work in education. And one of the things I work on in data science is turning things like talent into numbers, like how companies conduct performance reviews, whether you can use AI for that. And turning talent into a number that you can measure is very, very difficult. Can't Not to say it can't be done, but it's very difficult and I have yet to see anyone do it right. And this particular metric, oh, what was the national origin of the people who were co-authors on this study that was accepted into this particular conference? Sure, that's one way of thinking about people who are maybe sort of big movers or, or highly mm -hmm. influential in the AI space. But even this chart that you're showing now, it says our top tier AI researchers, that is such a broad term and we're really focusing just on a cohort of papers that were accepted to one conference first of all there's a lot going in ai that is not just that particular conference and the article does do a good job of distinguishing between training and generative ai related tools and other forms of more traditional ai but mm. either way it's such a narrow tiny little sliver there are a million ways that we could talk about contributions in ai and that brings me now i'm really on my soapbox to my broader point which is i struggle with this with my own students in data science there's this idea that in order to contribute to AI, you have to study programming and only programming. And if you even stray so much as to like too many statistics classes, you're somehow diluting away from this, this march towards the, the, the programming utopia that we're all seeking as top tier AI talent. When really a lot of the big innovations that happen in AI, they've happened since Alan Turing's time till now, happen because people have ideas that come from other fields. And so I don't want to sound like the old person yelling about liberal arts, but my <laughs> students who do, the best, who do the most creative projects, who do the best senior research projects, who, who do the most interesting things in my biased opinion after graduation, have skills in other areas. And my students, in my, I teach a senior course in natural language processing. I'll, I'll end my rant here. And, uh, the students who can program really, really well are, are valuable and they're, 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 they do good work, but they aren't able to actually ask and answer research questions. So the actual act, here we go, of turning something interesting, complex, uh, uh, important in the world, like language or translation or, uh, you know, reading resumes or whatever it is that you want to do with AI, you need to have these skills in these other areas. This doesn't mean force everyone to take a poetry class and call it good. But what it means is that being a top tier AI talent isn't just did you contribute to this one tiny <laughs> conference in this one niche field? Or are you the greatest programmer who's ever lived? And frankly, last, last, real last thing, I work with a lot of employers who want to hire AI talent, data scientists, computer engineers, software engineers, anyone. And they're just looking for the list of Python programs that they speak or the languages that they speak. And they have no concept of the importance of people who can think about ethical implications of the work that they're doing. Think about Elon Musk and the changes that have taken place with X, getting rid of a lot of different teams that aren't necessarily programming forward, it has a real impact on the AI ecosystem that we're living in. And I really, really have a problem with, with thinking that you have to be a very narrow type of computer scientist in order to be a valuable piece of talent in AI. I guess uh, the only... <laughs> the, the, yes, thank you. No, that was very well laid out. Uh, oh, the, the I, only really thing that, I didn't mean to. I actually think it's... No, that was great. No, it's well, good. Well, I mean, yeah. hey, you know, not everybody is passionate about this. So <laughs> it's really good to hear for, from somebody who's like, this is how this affects me and a lot of people that I'm educating. Yeah, no, I have students who are, who, who they, they narrow themselves down. They come to me and they say, hi, I'm interested in being a data science major, going to grad school for data science, working in tech or whatever. Um, and I am also interested in uh, music. I'm a classical piano player. I'm also interested in creative writing. I'm also interested in biology, biochemistry. And they say, but if I want to get a job in AI, I need to really zoom in. So I'm not going to take any of those classes and I'm only going to take data science courses. And our data science courses are excellent, but you're doing yourself a disservice, not letting yourself be exposed to other ideas, other questions, other ways of thinking that then you can combine with your data science skills. That's where innovation is going to come from. So we've just got this tunnel vision and whether they're coming from the U S or China, 
who cares, right? It's it's what's the breadth of knowledge that you have in addition to the skills? And, and this arms race is going to drive us into the ground, I think. When, I, when I think the, the, the worry is that if China is producing 50% of even the the narrow talent uh, right. that they'll they'll end up having more people able to make advances faster than the rest of the world and keep them to themselves right, right. and not share them with the rest of the world do, do you just just to wrap this up you know yeah. how concerned are you about that so there's two two views on this, right? So one thought I have as I read all of this and follow along is, you know, Soviet space race. I'm watching for all mankind right now, U.S. versus Soviet space race. And so there is this kind of talent arms race that could be going on or could continue to go on between China and the U.S. And look, I left the United States to go get a job in China. So it's definitely not the case that it's we can assume now as Americans that all the top talent, top talent, in AI are going to want to flock to the U.S. to work in U.S.-based companies. There's a really great, exciting things. One good thing is that this kind of competition could spur innovation. So that could actually be a really good thing for the world of AI. But a concern, of course, as you said, is we can get into worlds where we're weaponizing these things, where we have cyber attacks, where we have you know other sorts of unhealthy competition that could be going on. But the last thing I'll say about this that, that comes to mind for me is I was in China for three years. I was at New York University, Shanghai campus, and I was there when it first started. So this is 2013 to 2016. And one of the reasons the Chinese government wanted NYU to open its branch in China as opposed to you know let it go somewhere else was that the Chinese government at the time, so we were told, was very concerned about the lack of creativity coming from their students. The students were very excellent. They were taking, uh, you know, nailing tests. In general, China is very good at replicating existing technologies. I'm speaking in broad terms. But the Chinese government was very eager to specifically bring in liberal arts thinking and bring in creativity because they were lacking in innovation. So even though more of these, you know, if you take the top tier talent measure, uh, uh, as correct. Even then, I think we're missing a big piece, which is what do you do with that talent? Do you have the uh -huh. corporate organizational structures to breed innovation? Do you have people who are asking questions and challenging hierarchy? Do you have a space where people even think outside the box? And again, I'm speaking in broad terms, but my students in my course here in the United States who were from China, on average, struggled most with homework assignments where I said, okay, here's a data set. Here's a couple of interesting questions to explore. What method would you use? What are the shortcomings of using this method? What if you did unsupervised learning? What did you learn about the model? These open-ended questions students would really struggle with. And so there's a piece of creativity mm -hmm. that for all the problems in U.S. education, I think we're still doing very, very well. And I, I have yet to see that, that that has meaningfully changed in China to the point where the Chinese government is admitting. They were like, can you offer a course on creativity? And I was like, <laughs> I don't really think that's how it works, but go for yeah. it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we we demand that you be creative. Yeah. Is kind of yeah how exactly. I imagine yeah. It goes down over there. Yeah. Step two: creativity. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, before we wrap up, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it on uh, Tom's latest editor's desk. Um, he dealt with a question on how to keep a small website afloat in a world where AI tools are summarizing content without sending folks to a website itself. Dan wrote in, who works in digital marketing, hi Dan, and responded with some thoughts, including, we manage, uh, Dan's company, a lot of paid search ads for our clients, for our, uh, for our ad clients, and this, is very, uh, this very conversation has been discussed in our teams. Ultimately, Google, Bing, the giants of paid search are not going to give up that revenue easily as they're both building LLM platforms. I believe paid search will show up in LLM conversations in the future. Ah, and I can't wait for the Atlantic think piece on that. that will <laughs> oh yeah. Um, no, but 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 thank you to thank you to Dan. Uh, we got a few responses about this. Um, keep keep that feedback coming. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Andrea Jones Roy, thank you so much for being with us on the show. Let folks know where they can keep up with all of your musings. You can definitely keep up with all my musings uh, at Jones Roy on all the social medias, J-O-N-E-S-R-O-O-Y, as you can see, and uh, at my brand new website, datascienceneedsyou.com, where you can uh, check out, there we go. It's a very basic website, but uh, I'm put, producing videos from my Data Science for Everyone course at NYU specifically to attract folks who think data science and programming and STEM and blah, blah, blah are not for them. Um, and there's a free online textbook, so datascienceneedsyou.com. 
patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. It's Friday, and uh, Andrea, among many other things, is also a comedian. So we're going to play a few rounds of Who Am I? and try to guess which tech nerds became famous comedians, besides Andrea. <laughs> uh, so stick around if you're a yeah, patron Define for famous, that. but okay. <laughs> we're getting into way, way don't tell me territory, and I love it. Uh, but just a reminder, you can catch our show, DTNS is live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We hope you all have a wonderful weekend. We're back on Monday with Justin Robert Young joining us. Talk to you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and co-host, Rob Dunwood. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Technical producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCal, Captain Kipper, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Tom McNeil. Contributors for this week's shows include Chris Christensen, Scott Johnson, and Justin Robert Young. Guests on this week's shows included Trisha Hirschberger, Andrew Main, and Andrea Jones Roy. And thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>